Dragon Con, Carol from the Brit Track here. I'm the director, and with me today to talk about everything James Bond is private investigator Bob Nygaard. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Glad to be here. Awesome. I also have with me from Dr. Geek of Dr. Geek's Laboratory is Dr. Scott Vigay. Hello, everyone. I also have with me from the um, Earth Station Who podcast, Mike Faber. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. I also have Nathan Laws with me, who is the host of the 42 cast. Hi, everybody. And I also have a wonderful author, uh, Van Allen Plexico, who has written 19 novels, is a three-time winner of the Best Novel of the Year Award from the Pulp Factory Awards in Chicago. He's the host of the White Rocket podcast and on Her Majesty's Secret Service podcast as well. He's also publishing a uh, Alan James Porter's Bond Lexicon in 2021. It's pretty that, exciting. Uh, that is awesome. Cool. Nice. So we're here to talk about everything James Bond. And I know it's going to be really tough to co cover all 25 films, plus the books, plus all the other things going on. But we're going to attempt to try to do so. So in the, the wonderful things related to James Bond, um, I like to start off by talking about the films, especially some of the basic like tenets of what makes James Bond films what they are. So starting off with what is the one element we'll go around of James Bond films that you feel is the thing that a James Bond film must have. It's like the requirement. Let's start with Nathan. What do you think is like the requirement? Well, my mind instantly went to Q because he was such a mainstay of the film series for so long. Having those gadgets, having the, you know, the scene of walking through the area or going through the, oh, don't do that 007, you know, do this, to, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I, I love the Q sequences. I love having those gadgets. And so, yeah, having that, having that stuff, I think, is one of the quintessential elements to the films. Okay, Scott, what do you think? I think you have to have a really good villain, something you know that, that's going to put up a big challenge, something that only Bond can you know stop. Absolutely, like in Doctor No, the very first film, you have Doctor No, the guy that never blinks, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's uh, exactly. I mean, you you have to have a challenge, and your hero is only as good as the villain he fights. Okay. All right, Bob. What do you think? I think part of it is the style, you know, the, the clothes, the watches, mm -hmm. the cars. I mean, there's a whole industry that's, uh, you know, surrounding that whole, what yeah. did Bond wear? You know, what suit did he wear? What clothes did he wear? You know, what um, watch did he have on in which movie? You know, what car did he drive? You know, and- The car. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the car was big. I mean, the first thing that came to mind was gadgets, which Nathan said was gadgets. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that came to mind was style. And then the third thing that would be come to mind would be locations, you know, exotic locations where you film. And uh, so I thought that was the, the three big things. Okay, all right, Van, what do you think? Well, you know, I'll, a couple of things that Bob said there are exactly where I was thinking. The, the thing that was important about locations was even more important back when they started, because back in the 60s, people weren't really able to travel like they are now quite so much. And so going to a Bond movie, you got to see these locations that in real life you maybe never got to see. But that's beyond that, though, I think that the one thing that Bond movies have to have uh, is the unflappable bond that nothing gets the better of. I think that the, that the times in the movies that I'm, uh, that I'm the most bummed out are like when Roger Moore is the clown and everybody's laughing at him when he's trying to save everybody. I hate that because most of the time Bond should just be, you know, machine gun bullets go by. And what does he do? He kind of brushes off his ear straightens his tie nothing gets the better right. of him he's right. always confident so i just a super confident unflappable bond that is basically a superhero is is that is stylish and has those other things is what i would say one-liner exactly yeah, yeah. and the well, well, just the, the, the one-liners it's all yeah. mine right well, just <laughs> just cool he has he's cool mm -hmm. you know like they say steve mcqueen the king of cool i mean james bond cool <laughs> yeah cool yep. guy very true mike what do you think well, for me, it has to be the music. You have mm -hmm. to have the oh, yeah. score, not just the scores, but you have to have a killer theme to open the movies with. Anything yeah. from Shirley Bassey to Paul McCartney to, you know, Tom Jones. And, you know, you also, not on top of yeah. having the regular themes, you also had um, rejected themes. Mm 
for each movie. And we did a podcast recently on Earth Station One where we talked all about that and just the music of James Bond. And we could have gone on for three hours. Actually, Alan J. Porter sat in with us for that one. And we just had a blast talking about that. You know, not just the opening theme, but in later films, they, they had a secondary song that was exactly. the plot that, you know, and, and especially, you know, like I said, the, the Bond films of the 90s and before that kind of did that. There were Bond films in the 90s? I don't remember those. Sorry. <laughs> hey. Dude, hey. That's, that's hey. Golden Eye, man. Yeah, I mean, and it, you had the Bond, the Bond women, too, the Bond girls. I mean, oh, was, the Bond you know, girls were the I big mean, thing. You can't leave that out, you know? Oh, right. def definitely not. You know, each, each one, and some of them had multiple, and which was, you know, Bond was so suave, and he, you know, had a woman on his arm the whole time and everything. And of course, right. different eras, they tried making him softer towards women. And then the next era, he would be slapping a woman or something. And, you know, just like, it's just, it's just interesting how they kept on going back and forth with that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> I think for me, it's the one liners. It's definitely the title sequence. I think if it doesn't have the barrel gun opening mm -hmm. in it, you know, shot that then I don't feel like I'm starting off with the Bond film. Well, um, you had a few that didn't actually. I know, and it was kind of like, wait, wait, where's where is it at? It's supposed to be in here. And you know, the first two films, um, the guy who comes out isn't Sean Connery. You know, it's a totally different person. I can't, Simon something, I think it's his name. Um, and just having that sequence, I think, kind of like, all right, but this is a Bond movie. Um, and also sometimes just having like the opening score um, show up in random places where it shouldn't be. <laughs> um, like Bob is just like checking for bugs in his hotel room. <laughs> and mm. it's, it's true. It's yeah. like, and well, like, exactly. Nothing, nothing exciting is happening in this scene for Russia with Love, but the music's Wait. exciting. Well, exactly. Or you have the score, the music of Live and Let Die going through. Dun, dun, right. You know, it's just, it's just awesome the way they do that and they, how they tie it all in. It's pretty mm -hmm. awesome. And just the build up over the course, you know, of all of the films, starting with like this small budget that the producers had for, you know, the very first film, Dr. No, which is actually the sixth book. And a lot of people don't know that. They think that Dr. No is the first. It's not. And we were talking about this before we started recording about, you know, Casino Royale and what's going on with Casino Royale and why it is that we didn't have it for so long as a film. Does anyone want to comment on that? Oh, sure. Uh, well, uh, Ian Fleming, you know, was, as a writer and as we all know, uh, writers, you know, you have to raise money. And so he sold the rights to the, the, the television and film rights to that, uh, that book before the deal with the Broccoli Company. And and so there was a competing television film and uh, and then two other films uh, that were happening around the time. And I, so I think EON didn't want to compete with that. And yeah. not even to mention the fact that there are two versions of Thunderball for similar reasons, because McClory, um, Kevin McClory had the rights to the, to the screenplay and Fleming had the book. And so they ended up both getting the rights to make a different, two different movies, so. Right. Very convoluted, very convoluted stories there, mm. which is pretty fascinating. And then, like, uh, then on top of that, we've got like other iterations of James Bond that weren't necessarily inspired by the books, right? Yeah, the several got, movies sure. that don't have a. There's there's sure several movies that. that don't connect to a book. Like basically, right. and don't have the same title as a book. Sure, they ran out of titles after a while. They had to just kind of, basically, all the Pierce Brosnan ones. They just said tomorrow, death, die, yesterday. It was a deal, right? It was a roll of panel, and they came up with titles. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, uh, so it's Joe, Joe's curse uh, fault. You got it. I, I, yeah. One of the last ones that had any connection at all to an Ian Fleming one was. Um, uh, the Living Daylights, I think, was a uh, reference to a short story. And I think that was the last one that had any connection to an Ian Fleming. I mean, Goldeneye, that's the name of the resort that he owned. The house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, you know, the, the, the main house. Uh, so, I mean, that's as far as like, we're able to get. 
Right, and then even the name James Bond came from an ornithology book, right? It was a bird, it was a bird watching book, and the guy's author's thought name was. Because he thought it was a boring <laughs> name. He he wanted the he wanted the agent to not be the interesting thing. That's what's so amazing is that he chose the most boring name he could find, and it turned out to have because of the movies and everything, the books become an exciting name. We think James Bond back then, right. like mm -hmm. James Bond. It's like his name right. was Joe Glue, you know. It just it was right. And it's great the delivery, the way it, you know, when what's your name, James, James Bond, you know. Right, that's yeah. it's, 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 <laughs> that, that delivery is what makes it, you know. It's right. Bond, James Bond, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, what's what's really interesting about you know the actors? We had several actors play mm -hmm. James Bond, and. Um, you know, of course, everyone has their favorite. Mine's Sean Connery. He's my favorite. And um, he just is. And what's interesting, like with Sean Connery particularly, is that Ian Fleming did not think that he was, was going to be good for the role at all. He mm -hmm. was almost against Sean Connery playing him until he started seeing test, you know, test shots of, of him. Like one of the first scenes ever shot was when he was coming out of the airport in Dr. No and Jamaica. right coming to Jamaica and he was like, okay, he's got the walk, but can he talk like Bond? And it wasn't until, I can't remember the second scene that was filmed, but it wasn't until the second test film that Fleming actually signed off officially on Sean Connery. And, and what's great about that is that he grew to like the performance so much that he made Bond Partly uh, Scottish, uh, yeah. actually, and that's mm. and that's why. Right. It's interesting to yeah. see influence. So going around, we'll start with Nathan. Who is your who's your favorite Bond actor and why? <laughs> well, um, so I've always said Timothy Dalton. <laughs> which uh, first wow. one that I went to see the movie theater was Dalton. Um, but also after I started reading the books, which was much later, I, I came to the Bond films based on all like the, the, like the TNT marathons and all that when mm -hmm. I was a kid and I would watch like, you know, nine or 10 of them, you know, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I caught up pretty quickly to where they were with the Bond franchise. And so License to Kill was the first one I actually saw in the theater. But, you know, the more, when I started reading the books, I was, like, you know, the sort of harsher bond that Dalton plays is a lot closer to the book version. And I kind of like that take. I like him being, you know, I like like the Roger Moore bond can be fun, but he does not feel like that character to me. Yeah. And so, yeah, I kind of gravitated towards Dalton as kind of playing this sort of, this is the kind of guy you would pick to be a spy. He is a no nonsense, you know, I'm, you know, this this is what I do when I don't make any you know apologies about it kind of guy. Um, I, Craig has grown on me quite a bit. Okay, all right, that's fair. Um, Mike, what do you think? Who's your favorite one? Well, my first was Roger Moore, but I got very lucky growing up. I was a latchkey kid, and my parents just put us in front of the TV, and HBO was doing a James Bond marathon, and so. <laughs> You know, we got to see everything from Dr. No on, and Sean Connery quickly became my favorite Bond. He was suave. He was debonair. He, you know, he was, you know, once I started reading the books, I heard the character of Bond as Sean Connery. And from that point on, it was just a lock. And, you know, every Bond ever since, I compared to Sean Connery. And... You know, it just didn't live up. And then to see what Roger Moore ended up doing, making it more comical and humorous, that really turned me off for a bit. And it took me a little bit to get back used to it. And I think Timothy Dalton suffered for that, for, for me personally, because okay. of that. And so it was just interesting. And, you know, Daniel Craig is awesome. Nice. Bob, what do you think? Sean Connery all the way. And... I think the reason why is like Ben Allen was saying, unflappable. You know, he has that unflappable nature where bullets will be going right past his head and he just, just you know, doesn't even bother him in the least, you know? And then he, and then also he has a sly wit. I like his delivery. Like he, he times his answers to things or his, you know, when he was acting, uh, where he just holds off for a minute and then delivers the line in a sly way at times where it just gives me a chuckle. I, I just think it's great, you know? Right, that, like I, it, 
to have like two, a, two things, to be unflappable, but yet have that sly wit at the same time, right after something serious happens. I just find that right. to be great. My favorite is when he pulls up in the car and there's a dead guy in his back seat. And he's like, make sure he doesn't go anywhere. And then like gets into the hotel. Love it. I love it. Um, no, I, I agree. Um, so Scott, who's your favorite? Well, I, I, I tipped my hat already. Uh, Sean Connery, for all the same reasons that, that uh, everyone else has said. And I, I agree with Nathan. I prefer more of the, the darker bond. So Sean Connery kind of set that, you know, that standard and then when Timothy Dalton came on, I was very happy. I I loved his first film, and and uh, and everything like that. I thought, oh, this is a this is a good uh, pulling back from the Roger Moore goofiness that happened. Uh, not that not that I thought all of Roger Moore was goofy. Just that there was a certain level that that I wasn't. I didn't think it was Bond esque. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and the same thing goes for uh, Daniel Craig. You know, when he uh, gets his double O status, you know, how how did how did the first death go? Poorly. I mean that was you know that, that was believable and gruff and the whole point about you know a diamond in the rough you know learning how to become the suave agent I, you know or something like that you could see that with with uh, with Sean Connery and with Daniel Craig and Timothy Dalton those three you could see that work. Okay. You know, Royale, I call that Bond Begins. Yeah, yeah it's totally yeah, and that's, exactly. and that's why, and that's and that's why the what gun that's what, sequences at the end. Yeah. That's what they were supposed to do, too. It's, you know, basically, it's his coming an agent and everything like that. And that also led into the whole thing, you know, is James Bond and 007 a title, not just a person? Well, I, I think... <laughs> oh, gosh, you're going to go there now? Uh, I, uh, 007 is most certainly a title, but... Uh, we only James have so many much minutes, so I threw in. I jumped in with both. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, I, yeah. Okay. Well, let's back, done my favorite back yet. away from that for a minute because <laughs> it, it is mentioned in the books when they refer to the double O's offices, right? Yeah. And they're talking about their his because Bond had his own office, although he hung out in M's office with many penny all the time, but he had his own office. He had his own secretary, and a lot of people don't know that they had a wing of double O offices, and so. It almost is an implication from the books, at least, that it is just a position, right? That it's just just right. a job, it, and that it, the name is comes with the job, and that's that's what it is. Well, so it, the, the, the position of 007 is the seventh person in the 00 branch, you know. Mm -hmm. There, and we met multiple 008s, and which was great because it showed that if an agent died, the number got reassigned, sure. and you know they they kind of established that as far as. The, the name of the individual, I think that's your name, but uh, yeah. uh, anyway, well, that's a, a discussion for another point in the podcast. Right. <laughs> and, and Van, who is your favorite and why? Well, the best and my favorite are two different things. Okay. The, the best is Sean Connery, end of story, there's no, no question that. But my favorite is Pierce Brosnan, and we haven't even mentioned him. But he to me, he to me combines Connery and Moore together and the Ooh. best of both of them into one bond. And I love him yeah. so much. I wanted him to get to do more movies. His it wasn't his fault. The quality of his stories kind of dripped off, dipped off yeah. Yeah. Now the, the thing I'll say about about Roger Moore, he wasn't exactly playing James Bond in retrospect. He was a completely different character because he was trying to react against what Connery had done. So it's you know, you didn't judge him differently and they're just different movies and then Dalton to me yes he's like the literary bond I don't care I don't want the literary bond literary bond is kind of dull and drab I want the movie bond and that's Sean Connery and Pierce Brosnan and I don't really much care for Daniel Craig at all so there you go I've covered there the you go yeah wow Absolutely. I, I you only left out Lazenby you know I see what you're saying I like Lazenby a lot yeah, yeah I, I like Lazenby a lot too. I thought he did an excellent job for the what he was yeah, in. He, he, yeah, I mean it's a great movie. But mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, what you were saying about Pierce Brosnan, where I find it lacking with him, is just like the physicality. He's more like the pretty boy, where Sean Connery has like a certain stature, where he seems like a more of a tough guy, and Daniel Craig can play like a tough guy, like a physicality. Sure. But Pierce Brosnan is so smooth. He's such a pretty boy. He's so smooth that uh, I just lose a little bit of the physicality of the, uh, you know, 
of the part of the role with him. I right. think he does great. I think he's great, but I that's I just lose that little it's, bit of it. It's yeah. a fair point, Bob. I'll just say this: Connery was like that for like the first three or four movies, but by yes. the end. He's not like that anymore. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes. he went downhill faster than any actor I've ever seen. I mean, he goes into playing like Granddad, like within ten years. Man. Right, right. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. You're not wrong. You're not you wrong. Know. <laughs> you know, I do agree. Father with, time. Yeah. Right, I do agree with Van. You know, Die Another Day is one of my favorite. It's like in my top five, and. Yeah. Um, Mostly because I love Halle Berry. There's a there's an ice castle like mansion in it. I mean, come on, the car is awesome. Um, and you know, I think that it it what kind of fan you are and what appeal you you have in regards to the Bond character because he is he's rough and tumble and he's a tough and he's gritty, but he's also super suave. And you know, then you've got all the different spy things that come out that one you know Bond makes an emphasis on and another doesn't. It's like basic little things. Like in the early movies, you had minor little things like him putting a hair on the door. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you know, the spy that Right, or the yeah. powder, the baby powder on the suitcase. Uh, I really miss all the espionage stuff in the early yeah. on because it was nice seeing him going through and having to do all that stuff to yeah, protect right. himself rather than the more kind of like, well, just everything works out for him kind of thing. Right, right. Now, yeah. right. And then you get all the crazy gadgets because Q is not really told like in the films that it is Q until like the third, until Goldfinger, which, mm -hmm. you know, to talk about favorite movies, that's by far my favorite. I think it's the, it has everything. Everything that you guys mentioned about the quintessential Bond film must have. It's got a great score. It's got a great title sequence. The music throughout the whole thing is amazing. Bond girls are amazing. It has iconic scene after iconic scene after iconic scene yeah. from, you know. Um, had a great so villain. Had a great villain. You know? yeah. It all, it oh, all yeah. came together. Absolutely. Yeah, it did. Absolutely. Well, that's one of the things I loved about the first two, though. Like Kara was saying, it was more of a spy movie. It wasn't a gadget mm -hmm. movie yeah. and everything. And he had to use his wit. He didn't have to defend on the laser coming out of his watch or, you know, the exploding shoes or the briefcase or what is Q vehicle has he come up with this time? It was right. always, you know, Bond actually had to think about things and actually, you know, either use his fist or use his wits. And that's how he got out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my least favorite, Moonraker, because it, it's like, let's take Bond and put him, put him into space. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's like, let's try to be Star Wars, you know? I mean, come on. Well, that's well, exactly it's one of the reasons, yeah. why, I, it's one of the reasons <laughs> why I really like Casino Royale as sort of a step back into those early days of Bond. And, you know, when I heard they were going to make a Casino Royale movie, having read the yeah. book by that point, I was like, there's no way they're going to make this like the book. And I was really happy with it as an yeah. adaptation. Yeah. I mean, it, that torture it, scene, which I thought for sure, that's being cut. There's no way they're putting that torture scene in a PG-13 movie. And they did the torture scene. And yeah, not, it, 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 I, in that screen in that theater could sit straight while <laughs> <I am. laughs> and the only gadget is the defibrillator right in the in the car All right yeah i know there are no like super gadgets or anything it's just his wits yeah well then you also realize that bond knows par parkour also you know, right <laughs> Right. But I mean, he, he's running around a lot in the book. You know, there's all these little like one off things that they use and they make nods to from one book that's in, you know, a, a, a film that they use here and there. Um, one of the biggest nods that I haven't seen yet that I really I, I have this thing about James Bond and anytime he's fighting the Russians, it just makes me happy. I don't know why <laughs> it's going to be good. And specifically because I, I think it's in For Your Eyes Only. It could be wrong. He is talking randomly to to Fritz, and he's telling him about they're they're kind of swapping like where were you at last kind of stories mm -hmm. in a bar, and Bond mentions that <clears throat> that he is actually or was actually in Russia, and he got caught by the Russians and was marked on his face. Oh yeah. Right, gets burned like an M, I think, into his face, and he has to go and have surgery, plastic surgery, yes. to change his face because he can't. Like, they took yeah, yeah, you can't have distinguishing marks. Right, they they right. scarred him and then sent him on his way. Like, you're a spy, and the whole world's gonna know. And then he had to have to go Mersh, have surgery. Right? 
Which in my head, I'm like, that explains why there's different actors. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and don't even start me saying he's Gallifreyan. Don't even touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm surprised that they've done as far as, especially like we talked about before, you know, you have all of the books and we have, basically we have a film for almost all of them. What's interesting, a lot of people don't know is that Four Hours Only is actually a collection of stories. It's not, you know, it's it's not a singular isolated book, and a lot of people don't know that. And there's a lot of really good stories in there that that not really touch, which is interesting. So yeah. the Living Daylights is also the, that way too. It's just a name of a short story, mm -hmm. um, you know, and stuff like yeah. that. But yeah, I, you know, I, I have to say I really liked For Your Eyes Only. That was the first one I saw in theater, uh, and it, it, it's a Roger Moore one, but they had dialed back on and tried to make it more. Uh, believable, and you had the you know the decoder machine, and which is why I thought it was kind of funny that they they went back to almost that exact same problem for uh, Pierce Brosnan because you know it's still a submarine you know off course you know, right. uh, you know, okay. you know it, it's almost the same device. Um, so I, uh, but I thought that that was a, a really good solid uh, film that, that that showed some more spycraft than normal. Mm -hmm. Awesome. One of the thing, one of the things, though, that we didn't haven't mentioned, is the bad guys' headquarters in each movie. Ah, oh, the lair. The lair <laughs> you know, from the volcanoes to you know the yeah. space stations to, uh, like you said, and for your eyes only, that place in Greece, I think it was, which was a mountaintop where they had right. to take the the elevators up to. Yeah, the basket elevator, elevator, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was just so yeah. awesome. Yeah. So what? Right. So okay, let's go around real quick. What was your favorite villain's layer? Let's start with Bob. What was your favorite villain's layer? Uh, I think in Goldfinger, that that would be the one, you know. So, but uh, you know, the, I mean, the ranch they're in all, yeah. What's that? The ranch in Kentucky. The ranch in Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. No. No. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah, I'm thinking. No. See, I'm thinking of the one with the island. What's the one with the island? And. Uh, He's oh, man with, the, man golden with gun. the golden gun. That's, oh, that's the one I'm thinking of. Man with the golden gun with the island. Yes. I like that. Scaramonger's Island was awesome. Yeah. His yeah, island that's... and his extra I, confu I confused it there. Yeah, I was thinking of the island. Yeah, that one I like. Hmm. Yeah. Which surprisingly, most Bond movies end the same way that that is, where he's like in some water device mm -hmm. with a like, you know, he's with this lady. <laughs> like, he's. he's in a boat in one, he's in a raft in another, yep. and a submarine. Like, the trend here. <laughs> what was the last one where they did that? They did that for a long time, and then they stopped. And it it must have been uh, somewhere in the eighties, maybe, that they quit doing and that. I think well, it was the in the, it was in the eighties. It was like eighties, late the nineties, when they just stopped doing that. For some, yeah, you're right. I don't think so. Well, it was it, like with the Roger Moore movies, they kept on going. You know, oh, he was in bed with who, whatever the girl was, and yeah. you know, either a robot would find them or. You know, oh, we're going to talk to the prime minister, and you're going to be broadcast <laughs> to the world. You know? uh, right, yeah, something's right. going on with it. So, um, okay, Scott, what's your favorite villain lair? Oh, the volcano. Mm. Got to be from he only lived twice. You know, oh, that was so awesome. Yeah, it's so it, it's so awesome. In fact, I mean, it, it's got to be Mike Myers' favorite too, because <laughs> because his creation of that uh, in his spoof films is just perfect. Oh, with Doctor oh. Evil's head carved into the side of the volcano and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but even, uh, even even the bit where where you know Mike Myers is running around and you hear the the person on the PA system. I swear they got the same voice actor back to you know to kind of like be the voice of the of the goon on the on the loudspeaker. It's just really, really uh, that that attention to detail is pretty cool. That's awesome, Van. What, what's your favorite villain layer? Yeah, I would absolutely say the the vol. I think the volcano base of Blofeld with Donald Pleasance is just iconic. It's absolutely iconic, with, with including the metal shutters they close and they're having to get through them and everything. And you got the the, the Japanese samurai attackers and all that. But I, I guess uh, since since Scott said that one, I'm going to throw in Piz Gloria from On Her Majesty's Secret Service mm -hmm. up on the, the Swiss mountains, have to assault it yeah. with helicopters. That's pretty awesome too, with the cable. Yeah. Thing. That was really cool. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. I like that. Didn't they go back? Didn't they go yeah, back there for the uh, Timothy Dalton? Not Timothy yeah. Dalton. Um, no, one Spectre. of the Spectre, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, I think so. It was Spectre yeah. when they went back. Mm -hmm. Um. And then Nathan, what, what's your favorite? 
to me. I don't remember if we went to you yet. Sorry. No, no, you haven't gone to me yet. Um, <laughs> mine would actually be the volcano. That's what I was prepared to talk about. Um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's iconic, like Van said. Um, so I'm going to go with um, Dr. No's uh, headquarters on the island there that I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, the factory. Yeah, the factory, yeah. Mm-hmm. Guano yeah. processing plant. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that was a, that was a lot. Um, I agree. I think I think all of them are great. I do love the rocket in Moonraker and the scene. Oh, the it's space station. Of, yes, the space station. It's one of my when I he's agree. inside of there. Uh, it's one of my favorites. I I love Jaws, and I love that Jaws gets a girlfriend. <laughs> in one point. I love it. I love Jaws. Uh, I love, it's like good. I have this little part. Because the, the, one of the greatest things about, you know, James Bond is that there's always, there's some quirk to it in some way. It's either in his one-off mm-hmm. liners, it's in the characters who are, you know, throwing hats and cutting people, cutting statues' heads off, but not people's heads off, which is interesting. You know, and, and things like that happen as far as, you know, these little quirky things. You've got uh, the dynamic between Keel and uh, and James Bond. So, what would you say like makes the quirkiness in whatever you know of your, of the films that you've seen? What are some of the quirky little things that they've done that you just really really appreciate? Uh, so you know, I think I, it's it's sort of like the gallows humor, right? You know, because a lot of what uh, uh, you know, a lot of what the character is doing is you know matter of life and death and you're constantly aware and on edge. And so by, by parting a little bit of humor, I think it spawns way of coping with it a little bit. And so, so like with, you know, diamonds are forever, right? You know, it's uh, the elementary canal and he makes, you know, a, a, a reference to that so that Felix knows where the diamonds are. And it's a bit of a joke, but I mean, you know, he's, he's got, he keeps his wits with him and he just keeps them sharp. And it's just little things like that. Uh, you know, because I remember the first time I heard that, it was, you know, quite young. I'm like, I didn't get the joke. And so I looked it up and I went, oh, okay, that's pretty clever. And so th- that type of stuff kind of stuck with me when I think of Bond and the quirky bits. Okay. And that's what I think is missing from Daniel Craig is he, he doesn't do quirky. He doesn't really do funny. He's not very right. charming. He, he does the brutal, tough spy. Great. I'll give you that. But I just find that I, I, he's got that part down completely, but he's so missing all that quirky humor that it, I feel like I'm only getting half of a James Bond with him. Whereas with Roger Moore, I feel like I'm only getting the other half. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's one of the reasons all quirky. At the end there, you got a James Bond who could barely run upstairs. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that's scene, him running up the stairs of the Eiffel Tower was just oh. painful to see. He was 58, man. He was 58 when he made that movie. Can you believe that? And he wasn't even that I old. Didn't know that. I didn't know that he was 58. That's crazy. It's almost Scott's age, you know. Hey, 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 Roger, hey, hey, Roger, hey. Moore, Roger Moore. Roger Moore was older when he started playing James Bond than Connery was when he stopped. He yeah. just didn't look it yet. He looked in really good shape for those first two or three, but by the time you get in the mid '80s, you know, it's starting mm-hmm. to take its toll. Father time, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that's you know the, the joke about Bond being a gal friend when you get to. Uh, when you get to the, the episode in San Francisco and the Bond girl is the square root of his age, uh, <laughs> it, you know, uh, it, wow. it's, time re- it's time to regenerate. Wow. You know? yeah. okay. Well, I mean, like, and then what's really cool about the films and, and you have these classic, these classic novels and then you go on to the films that have lasted, you know, spanned decades. And you see the evolution of the way that the Bond girl's role is in the films. And Mm. going from, you know, the one-off misogynistic comments all the way to, you know, today, and it's a testament of the time period when you watch it really, you know, um, I was watching one of the films recently, and I think it was Sean Connery in, I think it was Goldfinger, where he tells her to leave the like leave like to leave that they're mm-hmm. having man talk. Like, man talk, yes. And he like 
pats her yeah. on the butt and like yes. she and she leaves this scene and i was watching with a friend who'd never seen a james bond movie before and they were like oh my god <laughs> yeah. yeah it's kind of hard yeah. watching some of those with the modern lens i think of thunderball when he's at the like exercise place and the woman that he basically blackmails oh. into sleeping with him, I find really? that scene very hard to watch right? because of how it's uncomfortable that it is. It's so oh uncomfortable. God. And then you have like these amazing women, you know, Holly Berry's one of my favorite Bond women. She's a nice, amazing. I love how, how, you know, the contrast between, between her and just like the the whole like I said, it's one of one of my one of my top five favorite films. And I well, think that why... like I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I mean no, and that's the thing about the, the Bond women is that you see these really cool things happening with them as they go. And even just money penny in general, you know. Oh, yeah, the rematch money penny is fantastic. Well, exactly. Yeah. The thing is, you know, you had like early ones where like in Goldfinger, you know, you had Bond, you know, you had three Bond girls in that one, basically. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first one got painted in gold. The second one, she died in a car crash or actually killed by Ajab's hat. And then, you know, the then you had, and then you had uh, Darling Pussy, you know, it was just awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I, mean, I like Naomi Harris's Money Penny. I think is she's excellent. You know, she. she oh yeah, brings that very much so. Wit. He brings that sly wit that James Bond has, but she also has that sly wit, and I love she, that part about her. She, I mean, she's oh, yeah. does such a great job. I mean, yeah, yeah, she she gives life to that whole role. I mean, it's just amazing what she does. And she, I mean, reminds, she reminds me of Lois Maxwell a little bit. You know, the third drill, the first, you know, just a little bit. She's got that kind of like. I'm gonna come back at you with a comment. <laughs> they go. Yeah, yeah. She's the only yeah. other. She's the only other money penny that really stands out, other than Lois Maxwell. You know, the others you kind of forget the ones in the middle that they just changed out every movie. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, mm -hmm. Harris is great. I'll yeah, say my she, favorite Bond girl for reasons similar to yours, Caro, is um, is uh, Michelle Yeoh because I thought in in uh, Tomorrow Never Dies she oh, was, she was awesome. Oh, she that was excellent. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, or, or how about the the CIA officer from uh, License to Kill? Oh, uh, yeah. You know mm -hmm. she, you know that was a, a really good character and very much like Michelle Yeoh, who was you know the the, the female counterpart. And you know we, we did uh, in the later Bond films they do mention female double O's. Uh, mm -hmm. you, just, you just never see Bond interacting with them yet. So well, you're going to get that in the new Bond movie, right? Coming up. Yeah, big yeah. honor. I know yep. I've been harping on it quite a bit, but I like Casino Royale because we finally see a woman who, mm -hmm. you know, actually is, is you know, uh, does not get played by James and does not just become someone he sleeps with. Is because She becomes the person that actually breaks him because yeah. of what had happened to him and everything and actually explains why he becomes a much more callous individual later and becomes more casual mm -hmm. with relationships is because of how he was broken by this woman. And so, I mean, that's, that's again, giving power back to, you know, the female side on the, you know, on those movies. So I, I, I find that fascinating. I also felt like the, they did that quite a bit that they, you know, kind of softened him up in uh, for her majesty's secret service, you know, yeah. when, well, you know, yeah. Diana Rigg, right well, there. They had to, I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah, they had to. Yeah. I mean, really. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. it was it was awesome. And you know, and then killing her off at the end kind of was like a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but it was perfect. Powerful, powerful. Yeah, absolutely. It's oh yeah. Extremely powerful. Yeah. That's why it's one of my favorite favorites. You know. Sure. Right oh there. yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's, kind of a, it's a kind of a stand, separate movie in a way because. The funny thing about Under Majesty's Secret Service, not only, you know, everybody remembers it's the one where he gets married and she dies, and it's the one that doesn't have, and it has the one-off Bond, Lazenby. But the other weird thing about it was the, the guy that directed it had been the editor previous to that. And they said, let's bring him in and let him direct one. And they just tossed him the book and said, here, film this. And so it doesn't fit into the storyline of the other movies. It doesn't fit into Diamonds or Forever, really, on the other end or back the other way, because you have a different Blofeld in every one of those three movies. <laughs> They're not the same character, you know, mm -hmm. and it's because he filmed the book rather than filming the cinematic bond that was going on. It's such a it's such an oddball, but it's great. Absolutely. Why didn't they get Telly Savalas for Diamonds Are Forever? Was it just because of he was filming Kojak? 
or why didn't they film like a serious opening where Bond is out for revenge on the guy that killed his wife instead mm -hmm. of just doing the mud pies thing? I mean, it, a, a, a Lazenby Diamonds are Forever with Telly Savalas would have been amazing, a serious one, like yeah. on her movie. Oh, yeah. Right. right. I, yeah, I get, find it very you know, jarring watching them yeah. in sequence because of that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we Absolutely. get a couple of John Connery. And, and they, they wanted Lazenby to come back. I saw an interview with them, and he, you know, he just said he doesn't regret the choice, but uh, in, in the interview that I saw, but um, you know, they wanted him back. He just didn't want to do it. Yeah. He kind of poisoned yeah. the well. He was so he was so he he decided I'm James Bond. I'm gonna go out and party and be a big shot. And he just kind of he burned a lot of bridges, honestly. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because he was lined up to do a bunch of other stuff, and that's why he decided to turn it down. And then he was a party guy, and they ended up not doing anything and not really having, you know, mm -hmm. doing much after that, which is kind of right. sad because yeah. he was so good in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Right. Oh, yeah. he was. You he wonder was so what, you know, good. what could have, what could have been, you know, had he continued. Yeah. I know it's just it's just crazy. I mean. And you have such this influence, you know, just the, the strong women in general. I mean, we get, you know, Judy Dench, Dame Judy Dench playing M, mm -hmm. who, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uproar about her being cast, but I, I adore her in that role. I think she's amazing. Oh, and and I, I think what's even more fascinating about her is that she's actually got to play two versions of that, of M. You know, yes. the, the version, that, that ties in with the the, the, uh, the original continuity with, uh, and, and then when Daniel Craig comes in, they kind of rewrite her a little bit. So all of a sudden now she's the dinosaur from the Cold War era, uh, right. a little bit, which you know, and not the the bean counter version of her. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, she has such great rapport with Bond. Uh, but I I love the way that she and Daniel Craig uh, interact and and. Uh, but yeah, she she was a, a a wonderful choice to take over that role. Yeah, I think you know her acting is just amazing. Where she is placed tough, like she's such a tough woman to Daniel Craig, and she stands yep. up, she stands up to him. But at the same time, you could see that she has this you know feeling for him where she really cares about him. And to pull that off, where you can do both those things at the same time, and then the audience really feels it, or I, I really feel it, like, you know, yeah, she could stand up to him, but at the same time, she really cares about him. I, I just think she pulls that off marvelously. I warmed to her greatly with the Craig movies because I really hated the, oh, James Bond, you're just a joke version mm -hmm. of the Brosnan right, right. one. And, and it's, it has nothing to do with her as an actress. It's just I hated the the writing of the Brosnan. It was the writing. So much. I agree with Capote. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, all, all that stuff about James Bond being this has-been joke was just something I didn't want in my movies. So, right, um, right. You know, that's, yes, I Great. much prefer her performance with Daniel Craig and being more of a a, a mentor figure. Yeah. Too. And Absolutely. Like when they when they rewrote her backstory for the Daniel Craig one, where all of a sudden she had all this Cold War experience and mm -hmm. she could relate to it, you get the feeling that maybe she was a field agent at one point uh, in her yep. career, uh, and and that's why she could be a mentor to him mm -hmm. and, and and see you know he was worth investing in. Yeah, it gives you an added respect for her, like her, yeah. Yeah. Like her character. It gives you respect, yeah. And then, you know, you have, because M, you know, he's been, a, that character has been around for a, a long time. So you, it's a, it's a high-ranking position. They had to have been an agent at some point, maybe even a double O, you know, like these are things that when you think about it, it's like, how did M become M? Right. <laughs> how did, what did they do to get there? Because they had to have done something. Yeah. And, you know, you, you get to see here and there, especially in the novels, you know, more about, I think, M in general, about, you know, his world. He even, like, calls James Bond in to his, like, gentleman's club at one point and is like, hey, I need you to help me with something off the books. And you get to see that, you know, reoccurring in the film with just with all the different actors that have played M, which mm -hmm. I think is a testament to the continuity that they're trying to bring, you know, what they of what they can do to the James Bond franchise as a whole. Yeah, and, and what I, I have to say, one of the things that I loved the most is as they're slowly putting things back uh, with the Daniel Craig era and slowly you know, putting the gun barrel sequence in the front again and slowly bringing things back. Uh, Universal Exports, when we actually saw the padded door 
uh, to M's new office and Ray finds his M. You're like, oh my yeah. god, you know how cool. Like, okay, we now we're now we're getting now we're going because uh, you know slowly but surely all the things that they stripped away, they were you know putting back. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's like ah. Uh... Yeah. yeah, all he had to do is throw the hat when in when he walks in. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> right. Or what's the? There's a line I can't remember what it is. Uh, the M always says to, um, says to Bond when he first comes in at the very beginning of a case. He always says the same thing. I can't remember what it is. I have to look it up. But it's something like um, I have something for you today or something like that mm -hmm. when he comes in sits down he says it like five or six times a, a lot every time bond comes and sits down and actually judy dench says it one time when uh, daniel craig comes in and sits down and i'm like it's there you always says now pay attention 007 <laughs> one, of the, one, one of the things that he always says is don't ruin don't wreck what i gave you don't wreck oh, yeah. Yeah. you know there's always that, that, that little piece. gag about i'm giving it to you in one piece but i know i'm not going to get it back in one piece <laughs> and he he saw right through bond all the time which is oh, yeah. awesome and that was cool the one uh cue that i didn't like though and people are probably you know put me up on a stake or something for this one is I didn't really like John Cleese as Q. Yeah, R. Oh. Uh, R, that's right. Yeah. Who's yeah, R? no, I, I I did not like it. I mean it was it was how they were taking things more silly anyway. And yeah, I did not care for for that as no. as the character. I, I like John Cleese in general, but not in that role. Oh, so do I. I love him. Well, it's a hard role to take over, especially when you know Desmond Llewellyn is right there. You know, you're like, well, I, I, we all know why this is happening, but uh, you know, the, the, you, you you look at John Cleese and you you see John Cleese. I mean, you expect faulty towers or or something to happen, you know, and and uh, well, yeah, you're right. In the handoff in Tomorrow Never Dies, also you got that scene where like Brosnan looks at Desmond Llewellyn and it's like, you're not going anywhere, are you? Or some words to that effect, and you know, because yeah. it's like you know that this is because they know his health is failing, he's getting mm -hmm. older, that they have to do a handoff, and it's just like, oh yeah. my god. So then having the buffoonery of John Cleese like next to that kind of like doesn't you know it doesn't sit well. Exactly. You know? No. Yeah, I mean, but then you, I mean, the cool thing is, is Q and his gadgets. I mean, what, yeah. what do you think is either the most absurd or the coolest gadget? Like you wish you had it. The like most absurd? The, the most, most absurd. absurd. Yes. The invisible car. And this is why. <laughs> because the cameras should have picked him up. If you're standing next to the thing, if the camera on the other side should have been, you know, your image. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, the, 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 so yeah. that is that is the, the craziest thing. Um, Scott, you're but, saying that the Bond movie just wasn't realistic enough for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, they, you know, the remote control car, I could buy that. You know, I could buy that. Uh, no, but the, the, the gadget I wish I had was the wristwatch um, dart gun. You know, that, that was That's what cool. I was going to say. Hey. All right. Yeah, you got mine too. That's what I was <laughs> <laughs> Let me let me just say y'all one thing that you may not know about that. The reason I think it's cool is A, because it's got both cyanide tipped and explosive, right? And he just happens to have the right one loaded every time he needs. You know what I mean? <laughs> on the centrifuge, it's not the it's not the sign that goes poink and bounces off and he dies. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, it would have been cool if he had the armor piercing when he shot uh, when he shot Drax though and see him blow up. But anyway, <laughs> right, exactly. the cool thing about that, this is a cool thing. That is the only Bond movie where he never uses a gun. He uses that wrist thing, but he never uses a gun in that movie. It's the only <laughs> one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nathan, what's your favorite or most absurd? Uh, <laughs> this is a hard one. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think like the sort of like a uh, car that converts into a boat is kind of a cool gadget. You know, I, I wouldn't Ooh. mind having that. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Bob, what about you? No, I was going to go with the wristwatch. You know, that's that takes the cake right there. Yeah. Awesome. Mike, what about you? Oh man, I have to say the watch probably, or but you know, little Nelly was also. Oh yeah, 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 the ultralight. Yeah, yeah, it was really awesome. 
<laughs> How about okay. the pen that you click and then you put it in somebody's yeah. right. <laughs> and slowly walk away. You know? <laughs> I am invincible. Right. Here, you use know. my pen. Yeah. I I loved the alligator head in the water. Oh, the submarine. And the, yep. And the duck. Oh, yes. And the duck. And the duck. Like, He's oh got the God. duck on his head. And then he gets out of the water. Sean Connery like has a duck on his head. He gets out of the water and pulls up his wetsuit. Perfect. And Connery yeah. makes that work. He makes that look good. We all wanted to go out and buy duck hats after that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mitch Butler's, Mitch Butler's proof you could do that. You know, they act, right? uh, yeah, yeah. And white tuxedo, right? Like mm -hmm. white tuxedo. Oh, Dinner jacket, yes. Oh man, yeah, absolutely. It, he like he comes out and he's you know he's always dressed to the nines and he always eats extremely well. One of my favorite things about the novel is the description of the food. Yeah, it's like it's true. I want that meal. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, my favorite item is obviously the Aston Martin. It's it's. Of no, course. If, if only, if only I had the money, right? Well, you know, they, they made uh, for the anniversary year. They made a replica that they actually, you know, sold, and and, all, and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, if only I had all the money in the world. You, right. you know? yeah. There's so if you've ever been to DC, there's a spy museum in DC, and it has. Oh yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. It, it is, is so cool. awesome. It is so cool, and you get to like pretend you're a spy and go around, and, and it's it, it's it's amazing. It's really cool. They have an Aston Martin. There, oh, did I can't you, Caro, did you do the whole thing where you had to go on the mission yourself and yeah. be picked up by the helicopter and everything? Yeah, I did all of that. Oh, I, oh, I was in there for like way too long. <laughs> <laughs> it is awesome. What you, don't know, what you don't know is that it's an evaluation test. The CIA is just seeing who, you know. <laughs> yeah. right. Right. No wonder now, they never called me. <laughs> so, the, as we close out our panel, I wanted to um, talk about, and this is for people who, uh, this is spoilers, about what's going on with Bond 25, also known as, I just forgot the name. Time to kill, something no, like time that. Time to die. Time to die. Time to die. No time to die. We're back to the Brosnan titles, man. <laughs> Tomorrow's yeah, no yeah. time to die today. So, yeah, yeah. There's been, of course, the trailer is out. It's been postponed because of COVID several times. It's supposed to come out in March. It's being released in um, the UK on November 14th, and it's being released here in on the, the 20th, which is right or, like the, my birthday is the 12th. So I'm just like happy birthday. Woo! Happy, happy birthday to you. <laughs> And, you know, I'm really excited and it's in, there's a lot of things going on, especially since the trailers came out and during the Super Bowl, there's an extra couple of scenes that were added to the trailers as well. Um, and we've got a whole new dynamic going on. Bond is supposedly, you know, has died supposedly and comes back and Daniel Craig, you know, in an interview originally had said that he wasn't, that that was the last time that he was going to be Bond. And then hinted in the past like month or so that the reason why he came back um, to play Bond is because of the way that they're closing out his Bond. Cool. Which is very Good. interesting. Good. We approve. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, actors course. who actors who've played Bond over the years have had, you know, a lot of a lot of controversy surrounded the surrounding them especially even daniel craig people were really upset they're like the whole blonde bond thing going around the internet of people being upset not, about it and then you know, it, was, it, was a thing. it was a thing and so now we've got this new this new bond film and we have some a few things that are already out the title song has been released um a while already, back. yeah right a while yeah. back so we got no time to die by uh billy eilish which I think is really good. I personally, I don't know what, what, so what is everyone's opinion and what are you looking forward to? Or what, what about the new No Time to Die? Um, let's go around, let's start with Nathan. What, what do you think about it? All right, well, I was not, so after I've been gushing about Casino Royale, I'm also a huge fan of Skyfall. I was not a big fan of Spectre. Um, I felt okay. like it was not, you know, the, the, the best movie. And when they kept hinting, like, this is like the secret that like ties, like all the previous Craig movies together, I wanted a lot more meat on it than just like, 
oh, this is like it's an abomination. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I just, oh, I, I was not happy with all the reveals in that movie. So I'm hoping with this one teasing that there's even more of a secret behind it and even more going on that we actually get the payoff that I really wanted. And since the odd numbered ones of the Craig ones seem to be the better ones <laughs> anyway, right. you know, maybe right. that'll end up being that way. But yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just a little, I mean, I see the previews and I'm like, oh, this looks like the greatest hits from all the previous movies. So I'm just hoping it doesn't end up just being the greatest hits of the previous movies all over again. I want to be surprised. So I'm hoping that we get something really cool and like some sort of like revelation kind of thing. Okay. All right, Bob, what do you think? Uh, I like the characters in in the uh, new one. I like, you know, I mean, I like Daniel Craig to start with. Mm -hmm. And then Naomi Harris is back. Uh, I like Anna de Armas. Uh, and then I like Lashana. I think she, I, yeah, I'm going to reserve judgment until I see it actually come out. But on that one. But, um, you know, I, I, I just, you know, like Naomi Harris coming back, Daniel Craig um, and Rami Malek. I mean, I think he would make a great villain. So I'm oh, um, yeah. looking forward to seeing him as the villain in this one. So that's one of the highlights oh, yeah. of what I'm looking forward to. Looking for the return of Naomi Harris, you know, the, the, the introduction of Rami Malek and the continuation of Daniel Craig and, and see how they yeah. do that. And then see how Lashana does, you know? Yeah, I think Rami's going to be amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. So uh, Scott, what do you think? Well, uh, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, you know, there's not been a Bond film I didn't uh, like. You know what I mean? Uh, so I'll be honest about that. I am a big wow. fan of the Bond films. Uh, you know, so I, I'm willing to just, I want to see how this plays out. I'm pretty sure, though, that, uh, that at the end of the film, there'll be an opening in the double O branch. Uh, you know, the, uh, the number will be reassigned again, I have a feeling. Um, and whether or not they actually make that uh, official with the whole his name, uh, a code name or not, or whatnot, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll see. But I, I, I get the, you know, the, the whole, uh, I, what's interesting is they played their cards a little bit early. So we know the big fake out uh, already uh, and, and stuff like that. So, uh, so I think that that's all going to get resolved before the end of the film. Uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's James Bond 007. I don't think they're going to abandon that. Uh, so, so I, so knowing that, I can kind of ignore that and, mm -hmm. and just enjoy the rest of the plot, whatever it turns out to be. Okay. All right, Mike, what do you think? I'm looking forward to it. I'm just, I've enjoyed the Daniel Craig Bond films. I think he's grown into the role really well as an aging agent and such, especially the last two movies. And, but it'll be very interesting to see what they do with it. This is also, you know, a lot of the stuff that they revealed and, you know, gave away already. I think we're in for a big ride that we haven't seen the best yet. Yeah, I hope hoping. so. But also yeah. remember, folks, this was a movie that was supposed to be out six months ago already. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for them saying it's coming out in November, that's wishful thinking. You know, we don't know, truthfully, if it's gonna be out in November. You know, I'd love to say yes, it's going to be at the theaters, but that's oh, a whole it'll be it'll release for sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. so, exactly. Right. It'll be, and so I'm hope I want to see it. I really want to see it. I want to love it like I've loved all the others. There's been others I've walked out going, it was good, wasn't great. You know, yeah, but it's, no, still enough, it's, it's still it's still bond, and I yeah, want to okay. I want to love this one. Okay, all right, Van, what do you think? My answer is two women. I'm happy that Leah Sadu is back to kind of continue that story. Kind of like Bob was saying, I like to see the rest of the story play out since these are the only Bond movies that actually are trying to make a coherent story across multiple movies. It's, you know, it's had its ups and downs, but at least they tried. And that's something they hadn't really made enough much effort before. Mm -hmm. But the other, the other woman that has me very excited about this movie, because I didn't love the writing on the last couple, is Phoebe Waller-Bridge. The fact that they brought her in to co-write the script tells me this could be a crackling, very funny in places, more human script than we've gotten the last few years because this is Fleabag. She knows how to do intera character interaction and comedy and stuff. And I have a feeling this could bring a whole new level of depth of, of, of humanity and character to this series. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. I am really excited about it. I think it's going to have a lot of nods to classic Bond 
I think it's going to bring everything back like really together. Just even watching the opening sequence, we've got our, you know, you've got your subtle quiet moments where he bumps into somebody and, you know, talks to them and they have little quips between, between the two of them. And then you have other ones where he's jumping off the side of a bridge and holding onto a rope and swinging. So, you know, I'm like, yes. I mean, if, if that's, Usually, you know, with Bond trailers, it's 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 like it'll give everything away, and then you see the trailer, and then you go see the film, and you're like, oh. And then you know, there's some where you see the trailer, and it has these big scenes in it, and then there's even bigger scenes, action scenes in the actual film that they hold off on. And I'm hoping for that because I do like the the Craig films myself. But except for Quantum of Solace, which we, yeah. none of us mentioned. <laughs> 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 Um, I do appreciate the nod to Goldfinger in Quantum of Solace with her covered in oil. Um, yeah, but I appreciate that scene, but I couldn't, I couldn't keep, keep, keep up yeah. with the, the, with the locations. It was like, where, where are we? We're in the desert. Now we're on an island. Now we're here. And, um, you know, it, it was my least favorite for that. Only for that reason, I thought that the premise for it was was good, and it was like, oh, okay. But I, as the past couple of films have happened, you know, Spectre by far is my favorite villainous group. Um, oh yeah, the the, the group, oh, yeah. not the movie. Yes, the group, <laughs> yes. the group, the or the thought of this organization and its power and what it can do and the way that it's like done is is incredible and the way that they've they've kind of taken with it, which is interesting because they've taken other groups from the books and shoved them kind of into Spectre. Um, which is fascinating, but I, I really want to see the end of it. I, I want to see what happens with it, especially in the trailer when he's standing in a room and you have like all these people around him and he's at a party and he's in his tux and then there's a spotlight on him and everyone backs away from him. Yeah. And there's this like really scary implication um, in that, so it, I think it's going to be really, really, really good. I'm, I'm yeah. yeah, I'm curious to see what the big chase scene is going to be. Like, like in in with this, the one that goes back to the Majesty Secret Service with the skiing, you know, and with it mm -hmm. chasing, and, and and that I always remember that. That sticks with me. That's such a great scene where they're on the skis and they're going down the slopes, and that big chase scene, and and that's something that you see in a lot of Bond movies is that chase scene. And I'm wondering what mm -hmm. it's going to be in the next movie, you know. Yeah, and it's got to have a helicopter. Yeah, there has, <laughs> to, there has to be one yeah. helicopter exploding per James Bond movie per contract, you know. Right, except for the first two, there isn't one. <laughs> Only because of budgeting. <laughs> I, I wonder though, you know, with the passing of time, sometimes you look at a movie in relation to the times we're living in, and I wonder if there's anything written into the movie that might need to be changed given the pandemic now and the way people look at the world. And, you know, are they gonna keep it exactly the same if it comes out in November and if it goes even longer, is there anything written in there that they need to change? Well, they've yeah. already said that, at least if it only goes until November, they said they're not messing with it. They said that yeah. they're not gonna edit it again or do anything, it is the same movie that was gonna come out in April. Oh, yeah, I was wondering that, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point, especially with Spectre, because Spectre is all about world domination and starting like hitting the reset button, you know, on the world and making society anew. So it's going to be interesting how that plays out in the new you know, no world, time right? Yeah, exactly. To see what happens. So well, it'll be fun to see. It has been a wonderful hour, and I appreciate each and every one of you sincerely for your time and for being with us and chit-chatting about all things James Bond. And um, it, just real quick, does anyone have, let's go around, where can people find you? So, like, Bob, where can people find you? Just Google my name. I'm a, I'm a psychic fraud hunter. I'm an investigator who uh, tracks down self-proclaimed psychics who defraud vulnerable people. And then they'll find me on Twitter, and uh, they just Google the name, and I'll be right there, phone number, I, you know, everything's there. Nice, nice. All right, Scott, where can people find you? You can find me at drgeeklab.com and on the ESO network. Okay. All right, Nathan, where can people find you? You can find me at 42cast.com and on the ESO network. Uh -huh. And Mike, where can people find you? Um, you can find me on the ESO network. I kind of run the place. <laughs> nice. And Van, where can people find you? 
uh, at Van Allen Plexico on Facebook and Twitter and at www.plexico.net. Awesome. Well, um, with us and us closing out this panel, you can find the Brit Track on all social media platforms by uh, looking at at Brit Track and kind of type that into the search. We are on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We got all the things. So we're really excited for the Dragon Kong Kong Con goes virtual show. And thank you guys again for being here. Really appreciate you. Thank you for your time. All right. Bye, Dragon. Bye. Take care. Bye.